Does Baylor's next head football coach already have a statue for him at TCU? This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for joining along with another episode of Locked On Bay. We're brought to you by FanDuel. I'm your host, Cam Stewart. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. I super appreciate that. Even when we have to talk about just how bad Baylor football is. I know I'm getting sick of it too. We got to talk about it. It's not good in like any way you can think of. It's not good. But once again, I'm focused on the defense today. Coming off a 42-17 loss to TCU in Fort Worth. Another blowout at the hands of teams that you were beating a year or two ago. Well, actually, I guess I'm not TCU. They never beat TCU. Um, But it's just another reminder of how far this program has fallen in the last two years. And Again, it's a a broken record. I know you know as well. But looking at these numbers from from Saturday, it's just awful, 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 awful. And I think one of the things we don't talk about as much is, you know, obviously it's a it's a dip in quality all the way around from two years ago. But really, the defense, the defensive drop is just concerning is not the right word for it. It's way deeper than that. Dave Miranda comes in as the defensive coordinator of a national championship team at LSU. And the first year they go two and seven. But what was the bright spot? It was the defense. You remember, it kept them in games. Um, the Oklahoma one is, is the one I think of. Uh, they got a defensive touchdown in that game. I think it was a pick six from Jalen Petrie. They had a pick six against Texas Tech. They lost both those games. Uh, but th- that was that's what was keeping them in games that year was, was their defense. And they just could not, it was the most pressure on them too because they could not score at all. And so you were thinking, okay, two and seven, year one, COVID year, kind of a wash. At least this, okay, this defense is legit. This is a defensive coach. Once he gets a new OC in here and gets rid of Larry Fedora, it's done. We're we're going, we're golden. And it looked to be correct. They bring in Jeff Grimes the next year. They have the best defense in the Big 12 in 2021. And look what happens. Big 12 championship, Sugar Bowl championship, top five final ranking. Bang, beautiful, lovely, most wins ever in a Baylor football season. By the way, you lost to TCU that year too. But that's neither here nor there. It looked like that was what was coming to fruition. And then last year, defense takes a step back. Doesn't seem drastic, but obviously the record is drastic. Six and seven from 12 and two. That's a drastic drop. So you get rid of Ron Roberts. It's like, whoa, okay, that's eye-opening. A lot of people wanted the other coordinator to be gone. Instead, it was Ron Roberts. Now, this year, you bring in Matt Powledge, a guy who had studied under Aranda. He was the co-DC at Oregon last year, and it has gone from just not good enough to, wow, that is really freaking bad. They had one of the worst rush defenses in the nation coming into this game against TCU, and what do the Frogs do? They get almost 17 yards per completion. They just gash them through the air. An OC that's been under fire all season long. I told you on the post game there was a guy in the section in front of the press box wearing a homemade shirt that said Fire Bryles. They've had it with this guy. <laughs> and he just gashes Baylor. Just gashes them. And embarrasses them and unfortunately that had to feel really freaking good for Kendall Bryles had to I mean they throw for 431 yards through the year which is they've only done that once this season it was against nickel state actually excuse me sorry once it was against BYU so I guess we're not that bad but they have only eclipsed that that total yardage once against an FBS team this year. It was also against BYU. So this is a team that has been struggling offensively all season long, all season long, and Baylor just opens the door for them and lets them in. I mean, this is this is just atrocious. And you could tell during the game too, like it was 
TCU on their first drive goes within the Bay inside the Baylor five. They fumble. It almost turns into a, a fumble return for a touchdown. If there was one uh, escape tackle, Caden Jenkins was gone. And Baylor then drops two touchdown passes on that drive, but still ends up scoring seven nothing in a heartbeat. And you're like, this is this is great. This is how it's supposed to be. And as I mentioned on the post game, first five drives of the game for TCU, five drives. They got inside the Baylor five each time. Each time. That should be what TCU is doing against Nickel State or against Long Island or Albany or Perkins School for the Blind. Not against Baylor. Perkins might have put up a better fight, to be quite honest with you. In the past defense yesterday, sure. But instead, Josh Hoover, who again, I said, you know, got some talent for sure. With a young, unproven quarterback, has the game of his life against him. He throws for 400. Two years ago, Chandler Morris throws for 500. <laughs> Chandler Morris, who can't even get, needs to get in the game in garbage time now. So, all that to say, there's twofold. This is twofold. First, Baylor can never beat TCU. Never. It took them three overtimes to have them win once against them in the last decade. And two, this defense has regressed immeasurably, immeasurably. And I, I don't even, I don't, I'm not even saying this is what it's supposed to be, but haven't heard anything about Matt Powledge. I don't know if the fans who have been clamoring for Grimes to be fired for two years now even know Matt Powledge's name, even know who the defensive coordinator is. He's in year one. Should we cut him some slack? Sure. But should it be this bad? Should it be this bad? I don't know that it should. If you give up 431 yards passing last week to Kansas State, fine. Fine. You know, that's a veteran quarterback. That's a good football team. You know, whatever. But to do it against a team that will, again, have to win their final two games of the regular season, one already off the board, just to make a bowl game, that's bad. I mean, I don't think we're putting this into as much perspective. We haven't been able to troll TCU this year because we suck way worse. But this was a team that was in the national championship game last year, and they have a very real danger of not making a bowl game the next year. That is all, that is historic. Teams do not do that in college football. Almost never does that happen. And yet... I say that to point out the fact that they pummeled Baylor into submission. Just pummeled them. Gave, threw them a little bone on the first drive and said, ah, you know, give them a little confidence. Let them in the end zone. Dominic Richardson, first touchdown of the season in week 11. Let's just give them that because we'll give them this little head start. You know. It's like Usain Bolt giving me a little head start in a race, 100 meters, and then they just boat raced us. Just boat raced us. And barely broke a sweat, man. Barely broke a sweat offensively yesterday. On third down, yesterday, or excuse me, Saturday, Baylor was 5 of 14. TCU was 9 for 11. Nine for 11 on third down. I have never seen a third down performance that bad outside of a small time high school football game. That is freaking atrocious. How explosive you let this TCU offense be. Nine for 11 on third down. If it's, if it's even Matt Pallage's second year, you get canned for that. I don't care how young the guys are in the secondary. No adjustments at all. Nine for 11 on third down. Putrid. Absolutely putrid. So if you are going to go, I mean, I, I we heard a lot in the post game. Sorry, I'm all over the place. About people wanting to go offensive for the next head coach because it gets some excitement. I get that. I get that argument. I wouldn't hate that at all. But by these numbers, you need to go defensive, I think, personally. And... I think there might be someone who could be able to do that. Why don't we listen in? That's because our first sponsor is listening.com for today's program. 
and I lost my ad read. Here we go. Coming back. Why don't textbooks and research papers come with audio versions? That'd be convenient, right? You do it with audio books. You listen to them on a long ride, everything like that. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could listen to it like an audio book? That's a great way to learn. Well, now you can. Listening.com is an app that turns any academic reading into audio. It can pronounce difficult technical words. TikTok can't do that. Read math equations and even knows how to skip the citations and footnotes so you're not wasting your time. If you go to listening.com slash locked on, you're going to be able to get your first three weeks for free. Go on the website without using locked on. It's going to say two weeks. But if you use that code locked on, it's your first three weeks for free. The deals don't get much better than that. Go to listening.com slash locked on for that offer. That's listening.com slash locked on. Listening.com, first time sponsor. Thank you for sponsoring today's show. So maybe listen to me on this one. Gary Patterson. Gary Patterson. TCU's all-time winningest head coach. One of the best head coaches of this century, bar none. He's got to be up there. Top five? Sure. He said on the Matt Mosley show last week on ESPN Central Texas, of which I also work for, said, I'm, I'm not done, Matt. I'm ready to coach. I am ready to coach again. I've got a staff. I'm ready to go. Was canned at TCU in 2021. Special assistant at the University of Texas in 2022. On the golf course this year. 63 years old. He's got some got some good years left in him. He said, I've got a lot more games. I've got more wins left in me. So I think there are some schools that should be looking at a guy like Gary Patterson. And yeah, I think Baylor probably should be one of them. Should be one of them. Now, this, this got a lot of backlash uh, from people on Twitter throughout the last few days, not only from the Matt Mosley interview, but from Connor Martin, former Baylor uh, kicker who said, yeah, I would take Gary Patterson at TCU, got dragged in the replies. These Baylor fans, these Baylor Twitter fans do not want him. Why? Why not? This guy is a, a slam dunk Hall of Famer, 180 wins to his name and only 79 losses in over 20 seasons as a head coach. Hell yeah, I'll take him. Of course I'll take him. We got to remember what Gary did up at TCU, man. I mean, we know what Art did here at Baylor. Gary did it for even longer and scandal-free. How about this? Just looking at, how about, let's start with the defense, right? Defensive genius, okay? And we talked about this, this horrid defensive performance Baylor had on Saturday and have had for the last two years. Well, how about this? In nine full seasons in the Big 12, I'm, I'm, not counting the Mountain West because his numbers are going to look even better there. But since he moves to the Big 12, Gary Patterson, in 2012, nine seasons, they were in the top half of the Big 12 in points scored, points against per game in every season. Every season. Can Baylor say that? No. Got more Big 12 championships, but they can't say that. <laughs> and looking at it too, 2021, Baylor had the best defense in the conference. We knew that. And it was back and forth all year between Baylor and Oklahoma State, two of the best defenses in the country all year long. So a natural answer would be from you when I ask you who was number two in the Big 12 in points against per game that year, you'd say Oklahoma State and third isn't even close. You would be wrong. Texas Christian, the, form, the school formerly known as Texas Christian, was number two in the conference in points against per game that year. Gary. Gary. Yeah. This is, he is a defensive genius. And then back to my former point of, we saw what Art did to turn around Baylor, a program that, you know, for, for at least the first, the last 15 years before him was dreadful. But for most of their history, it's not glowing, right? Well, TCU's is the same way until the year 2000 when a guy named Gary Patterson was promoted to head coach. So let's look at this. Some about this first stat? TCU did not appear in the AP poll at all, at all. 
from 19, between 1960 and 1984. Okay, they were ranked in 1984 at one point in the season. Didn't won the final rankings, and then they didn't appear again. So they, 1984, and then in 1990 they appear, and then not again until the year 2000. Huh, that sounds familiar, Cam. That sounds like the year you told me Gary Patterson took over as head coach. Darn right. Because after that, these are the final rankings that TCU had each of those years. Okay, not just some point in the regular season, the final rankings that TCU had every year of Gary Patterson. 21st, 23rd, 25, 11, 22nd. They didn't get ranked the next year. And then Gary goes 7, 6, 2, 14. Mm, but then he doesn't get a final ranking the next two years. Oh, yeah. Those were his first two years in the Big 12, switching from the Mountain West to the Big 12. And then 3, 7, not ranked, then ninth at TCU. This is what the record should be at Texas and Notre Dame and, and, and USC for a downslide. Those schools didn't have that. Didn't have that, brother. TCU did because of Gary Patterson. Gary freaking Patterson. So if you're doing the math on how many numbers I just gave you, that means just one time, one time in his 20, almost 22 seasons at the helm, did they not appear in the AP poll at all? One time. That's as many times as Dave Aranda has done it this season. They were hadn't appeared at all this year. They didn't appear at all in 2020. They were out pretty quickly in 2022. Didn't appear in it at all in 2018 under Matt Rule. Obviously not in 2017 under Matt Rule. Last four games of the season, you didn't appear in it in 2016. So that's what I'm trying to say is that level of consistency doesn't even come around at Baylor in their best decade. And, and no scandal whatsoever, what to speak of. His biggest scandal was that he just hated Art Bryles and would kind of make things up. I will agree with that. He would say that Baylor players like flipped him the bird or something. And that, that didn't happen. But because he was mad online, that's the biggest scandal he's got. And Baylor fans don't want him because, I don't know, he's sweaty. Because he didn't like the the most shamed head coach in Baylor history? That's why we don't want him? Because he coached 100 miles up to the north and made them one of the most relevant programs in college football the last 20 years out of the complete doldrums? That's why you don't want him? Give me a break. Sack up. Let's win some football games and not risk the lives of and the well-being of our females on campus while doing it. Come on. I just don't get it. Why some Baylor fans don't want him. Now, if you use the argument, hey, Cam, he's 63 and he's starting over. And he hadn't really coached in the NIL and transfer portal era. Okay, that's fine. I'll take that argument. I'm not going to. I think it's Okay. You know, NIL hasn't been around there forever, but we, you know and I know there were programs out there that could promise fame and fortune and everything that went with it for years and for decades. TCU wasn't one of them. I'm talking about the big boys in the conference that are heading out the door, Texas and Oklahoma. Okay, so they out-recruited Gary Patterson over those years. So freaking what? Gary Patterson went toe-to-toe -to -toe and beat them on the damn football field every year. He developed the talent. I don't think he'll have any trouble developing talent. Even if he's got to recruit a new team every year. He was recruiting guys to come to the Mountain West. Coached the year of LaDainian Tomlinson, a Hall of Famer. Brought in Andy Dalton, the quarterback from Katy, which if you're outside of Texas, you don't know. Katy carries some serious weight here in high school football. It's one of the top programs in the nation. Brought that kid to TCU, and all they did was win the damn Rose Bowl from the Mountain West and have two top five finishes, including number two in the nation in 2010. And you don't want him here? 
give me a break. Give me a freaking break and give me Gary Patterson at TCU. Now, would he want to come here? I don't know. He hates Baylor. He'll play patty cake with Mac Rhodes, I'm sure, but he doesn't like Baylor still. But that's not the question. The question is, would you take him? 11 times out of 10, I'd take that guy. And I'd win some damn football games. Gary Patterson aside, today's episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. It's the official partner of the NFL, and it's also America's number one sports book. And it's a great, great time to be hitting FanDuel with all the sports we got going on. The college football games outside of Baylor just keep getting bigger. The college basketball games are heating up with Feast Week stuff. It's Rivalry Week. You also got the NFL, NBA, NHL all going on right now. So no better time to visit. And if that doesn't convince you, how about this? New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. That ain't bad. And if, so if you're thinking about joining it, it's also pretty easy to do. Okay. You can do anything from spreads to player props, over unders, all of that. All you got to do is visit fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel.com slash locked on. Take the time. It's the most wonderful time of the year if you're a sports fan and you want to bet on it. This is the time. One more time. Fanduel.com slash locked on. Fanduel. America's number one sports book. Rounding things off to start out your week with the Lady Bears because I told you, I told you on Wednesday, it's a team to be reckoned with, so I got to keep talking about them. They won again yesterday, beat Harvard. Harvard team that's good, by the way. Good in the Ivy League. Um, you know, did, should they have won by 20? I guess, maybe. They won by 10. One by 10, it was kind of nip and tuck in the first half. They were got the got ahead in the second half and took the car into 10 and 2 and got it in the driveway. That's a good win. After just beating number five, Utah, the letdown that a kind of game like this could be, even though it's a good team in a, in a smaller conference, but you hear Harvard, you're like, these kids are studying for finals. You know, you know, it's, St. Stanford or LSU or Notre Dame or UConn. It's Harvard. Easy to be let down, right? Not this team. Not this team. And they and they played really well in flashes today. Yesterday. Golly. Hmm. Yesterday. <laughs> they played really well. And again, I was impressed by Drayana Edwards. And, and I, what I noticed about her during the game is that she can be you know, she's never going to be really a 30 point a night type of scorer or get to it, the get to the rack and, and put up the numbers that Nalissa Smith did. But she doesn't need to be that to be the most dominant offensive player on the floor, which Nalissa could do too, by the way. But she doesn't need to do that. And yesterday, 14 points, six of 10 from the floor, two of six from three. Okay. Four rebounds, three assists in 21 minutes. That's an all-around player right there. And when I say that about her offensive game is it just comes so easy to her. She doesn't make mistakes. She knows when to shoot. She knows when to put the ball on the floor. She knows when the mismatches are there. That's what I mean by she can be the most dominant offensive player on the floor without having to score even 20 points. Because she just the game comes so easy to her. It's like in slow motion, and that's what makes someone dominant is when you, you, can't, you can't get in her head and force her into mistakes. You can't back her into a corner offensively. She is that efficient and that good. And how about Nikki Collins' team spreading the love? Okay, looking at the starting five here, which is Triana Edwards, Asia Blackwell, Sarah Andrews, Jada Walker, and Dariana Littlepage Bugs. In that order, 14 points, 16 points, 11 points, 13 points, 13 points. They all get into double figures. And let's add that up. That's 37, 53, 67 of your 81 points come from your starters. I'll take that any day of the week. Any day. <laughs> Spread it out. Play good defense. Darion Little Page Bugs, by the way. I thought maybe we'd be in for kind of a sophomore slump just because she was thrown into a, a bigger role next year. Maybe the expectations were a little bit too high. She's been great. 13 points, 6 of 10 from the floor. Nine rebounds, a couple of assists. 
In 37 minutes, she played the most out of any starter. 37 of the 40. That's a, that's a stud right there. That's a sophomore you're building around right there. Sarah Andrews, not her best game. Three of eight from the floor, 0 of two, five of eight from the free throw line, which has gotten better. Did get a technical foul in the game, but spread the love around. Four rebounds, three assists in 30 minutes. I'll take that from your point guard. Asia Blackwell. Nikki said it after, after the, the win over Utah. We're seeing a new Asia Blackwell. We are. She led all scores with 16. Or excuse me, led the Baylor scores with 16. Five of eight from the floor. This team is good, man. This team is good. And they've got some good competition before hitting the conference schedule, uh, including Oregon. Good, good program. This team's going places, I really think. I said it before, I'll say it again. I think this team's competing for the Big 12 championship. Get on the bandwagon, y'all. Get in the feral before it closes down. Get in the foster. Because this team brings intensity, play good defense, and they're a smart team. They really are. They made some mistakes last year. You could see it during the games because they were, they were so young. They had so many injuries. There were rotational pieces that weren't supposed to be rotational pieces. But this is where it pays off because now they have that experience. I know there are some people, a silent minority, who are saying that about the Baylor football team, especially on the defensive side. And and these young guys, that's going to pay off them getting the experience. That's going to pay off in two years. It, you're seeing it play out in women's basketball right now. And they're just going to keep moving up the rankings. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with. And also keep an eye on Harvard. Just keep an eye on them. That looked like a conference championship team today. Yesterday. God. Yesterday. <laughs> that looked like a really good basketball team. If Baylor just beat them by double digits, that's going to be a good RPI win down the road. They'll get enough of those in the Big 12. Anyway, what are your expectations for the Lady Bears this season? Drop that down below in the comments. Do you want Gary Patterson as Baylor's head coach? You know how I feel. Drop that down below in the comments. Do you go offense? Do you go defense as the next Baylor head football coach? Drop that down in the comments. Do you go head coach or assistant coach? Drop that down in the comments. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to talk a little basketball this week. But also, you know, keep an eye on those names that are out there as these seats keep getting hot. The Toyota sales event, December to remember, sales event goes on. More boats on cars, more coaches getting fired. We'll keep you updated with it on the only daily podcast all about Baylor Bears athletics not coming from Baylor athletics. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm your host, Cam Stewart. And this is, of course, Locked on Baylor.